going to give you a nice little Father's Day present this morning to all the guys. I'm going to preach real short. So I'm, I'm going to just preach short. I'm, I'm going to blow in. I'm going to blow up. And I'm going to go ahead and blow you on out. Amen. <laughs> and you go ahead and enjoy your day. Happy Father's Day, Dad. Happy Father's Day, Granddad, Spiritual Dad. Happy Father's Day. You know, I've been thinking about what I'm going to speak. And uh, I have a little message here, but I really wanted to just share with all the dads this morning before I preach, uh, to share with you how much we need you, how much we need you. I think sometimes we could forget uh, the importance of our role and the role that we play in the family and also in the church. And I want to just encourage all the dads to know we need you. Don't give up. Don't give up. You know, there's a lot of reasons to want to quit, a lot of reasons to want to, you know, stop being that dad. But I want to encourage you today. Don't give up. Stay in the fight. There's a blessing on the other side. Amen. Praise the Lord. Amen. Hallelujah. Genesis 19 in verse 14. And if, if you don't have it, we'll have it on the screens for you. It reads like this. It says, So Lot went out and spoke to his sons-in-law, who had married his daughters, and said, Get up and get out of this place, for the Lord will destroy the city. But to his son-in-laws, he seemed to be joking. He seemed to be joking. And when the morning dawned, the angels urged Lot to hurry, saying, Arise, take your wife and your two daughters who are here, lest you become consumed in the punishment of the city. And while he lingered, the men took hold of his hand and his wife's hand and the hands of his daughters. And it says here, the Lord being merciful to him. I mean, we're grateful for the Lord's mercy in our life. They brought him out and set him outside the city. So it came to pass when they brought them outside that he said, escape for your life. Do not look behind you nor stay anywhere in the plain. Escape to the mountains lest you be destroyed. But this morning, I, I want to just take a few moments to talk to you about the choice of champions. The choice of champions. How many of you want to be a champion for God? Champion for God. Look at your neighbor and tell them it's going to be a good word. You may be seated this morning. I'm going to ask everybody just to settle in for a moment and not to move around because sometimes that's very distracting. But this morning, I want to talk to you about the choice of championship fathers, the choice of a champion. Many of you know that Lot was the nephew of Abraham. And you may remember that when, when God called Abraham out, that Lot attached himself uh, to the Lord, Lot attached himself to Abraham and also to Sarah as Abraham went on his journey for God. And along the journey that Abraham went on with the Lord, we know that not only Abraham, but also Lot experienced great blessing within their life. That because they followed the Lord, the Lord was able to bless them immensely. In fact, when you read in Genesis chapter 13, you find that Abraham and Lot had gotten so blessed. I mean, just think, they had started out with nothing, and then they followed the Lord on this journey. And these two men had received so much blessing that they were forced to separate due to growing strife between their herdsmen and their workers. And think of it for a moment, even with Lot. That when Lot attached himself to Abraham, his spiritual father, through the blessing of the Lord, God actually made Lot a spiritual father himself. And here they are in this land of promise. And because they're following the Lord, the Lord blessed them so greatly that they actually had to separate because the land they were dwelling in, dwelling in excuse me, did not support both of them. So what did Abraham do? He looked at Lot and he gives Lot the first choice on what direction to take. And it is here that we see the difference 
in the values and the convictions between two fathers. Because we're all fathers, but not every father has the same values and the same convictions. Between Abraham and Lot, we see the difference between their two, two, two convictions. Now, here's what I want to share to you this morning. As fathers, we make our choices, and then our choices make us. Should I say it one more time? As fathers, we make our choices, and then our choices make us. But let me also say this, is that our choices not only make us, but our choices also make the people that we lead. And if you're a father this morning, whether you're a grandfather, a, a, a father, or even a spiritual father, we must be careful about the choices we make. Now, let's take a look for a moment. What was the difference between Abraham and Lot? Well, very simply, when you look at Abraham, you see that Abraham feared the Lord his God. How many of you fear the Lord? I'm not talking about being afraid of the Lord. I'm talking about the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. How many of you fear the Lord? Well, right here we see that Abraham, he had, a, he had a, a very real respect and fear for the Lord. You see, Abraham, in the story we find, he trusted God for the land that God desired to give him. God told Abraham, I'm going to give you a land. I'm going to give you a territory. So Abraham, from the very beginning, trusted God for that land. Now, when you take a look at the land that God wanted to give Abraham, it wasn't perfect land. It was a good land. It was a goodly land, but it was a perfect land. The, the land had its problems. The, hand, the land had its issues. But in the end, Abraham recognized that that was the land where God wanted him to be. That was the land where God wanted him to be. And because Abraham feared the Lord, Abraham said to himself, I want to be where the Lord wants me to be. I want to dwell in the territory the Lord wants me to dwell in. You see, Abraham and his children, you know that Abraham had children, right? Isaac and Jacob. They also had a deep conviction and a fear for the Lord to dwell in the land that the Lord wanted them to be. They did not allow the enemy to drive them out of that land. Now, when you think about dwelling in the land, I want you to think of it this way, is that Abraham wanted to be in the perfect will of God. Think about that. Whenever land is, is, is mentioned in the Bible, think of it as being in the perfect will of God. I think that's one of the great markings of a godly father or a godly parent. It's a parent that no matter what happens, they say, I don't want to be taken out of the will of God. Come on, say amen. amen. You see, he, he had made that decision. And I want to say something to our fathers this morning. The best decision you can make is to stay in the will of God, and to seek God's will and perfect plan, not only for you, but to seek his will and perfect plan for your family as well. Abraham was the type of leader that he didn't do anything without first seeking God about it. Now, how many of you want to have good success? How many of you want to have breakthrough in your family? How many want to have blessing? Then recognize that in order to have that blessing, you must have the conviction that I'm not going to make any type of decision until I seek the Lord about it. Seek him for the direction. Seek him for direction for your marriage. Seek him for direction for your family and your children. So the first thing we see is that Abraham feared the Lord. The second thing we see here is that Lot. Now, I wrote here that Lot didn't fear the Lord. But I think in reality it was this, is that Lot got away from the fear of the Lord. Because if you look at Lot's life, you see in the beginning he was blessed. As long as he was with Abraham, as long he was walking with his spiritual father, as long as he was in the land of promise, he was blessed. But somewhere in Lot's life, he got away from fearing the Lord and following his plan. Would you agree with that? See, when I look at Lot, I, I think what happened was this. And I think this happens sometimes. I think this might even be happening to some of you this morning. Is that Lot was enticed by the immediate gratification of Sodom. He was enticed. He was drawn in by the immediate gratification of Sodom. 
I think in Lot's mind, he may have thought that money, power, and personal gain were the right direction for his family. And when I really take a look at Lot, because I like to look at these Bible characters, what I kind of feel is that Lot had forgotten that living in God's will was good for him. He forgot how blessed he was because of God. He forgot that God was the one who was his source. He forgot that it was the Lord that gave him the cattle. It was the Lord that gave him the sheep. It was the Lord that gave him the territory. It was the Lord that gave him the healthy children. Come on, somebody. Has God been good to you when you've been serving him? But I think what happened here is Lot thought, that there was more. He was dissatisfied. And let me tell you something. That's a dangerous place to be. To be dissatisfied. I mean, let me ask you a question. How blessed do you want to be? Would you, do you want to be so blessed that you would compromise God's will within your life? See, what Lot did is he kind of, to be honest with you, lost the, the conviction and the fear. And he thought that, well, if I can move to the city there would be more opportunity. You see, we see that Lot changes direction. He changes direction away from the Lord and Abraham, and he actually attached himself to the city. He went from being attached to Abraham to now being attached to the city. You know what I think happened a lot too? I think he, he fell for some of the trappings of success. Some of the trappings of success. You see, I, I've said this to you and I'll say it to you again. If the devil can't kill you with too little, he'll kill you with too much. And I see it in the church so much. So many people that they get to a place of success and they don't know how to handle it. In fact, they sell out. And that's what Lot did. He sold out for the city. After all the blessings God had given him, he makes this decision. And you find that even when he went into the city to Sodom, Sodom was conquered. And so Abraham, being the compassionate leader he was, went into the city with his 300 men, and he actually rescued the city. And he tells Lot, get out of the city. It should have been a sign. Lot should have been smart enough to see that the city was conquered one time and he was given an opportunity to get out of the city and Abraham tells him, get out of the city, uh, Lot, get out of here. But Lot, instead of getting out of the city, he went back into the city. He went back into the city. Just like some of us that are here this morning. God rescued you one time. God rescued you two times. God rescued you three times. We're telling you, get out of the city, get out of the drugs, get out of the issue, get out of the relationship. Don't you see God's trying to speak to you? But instead of getting out, you run back to the city. Is it the word or what? And the story picks up in Genesis chapter 18 and 19, where God finally says, I'm going to destroy Sodom. It's going down, Jack. I've had enough. The wickedness of the city is exceedingly great. It's gotten my attention. And once again, Abraham, being an image of Christ, stands up in intercession and he begins to try to convince God from holding back his judgment on the city. He tells God, listen, if there were 50 righteous people in that whole city, would you save it? God said yes. But God knew there weren't no 50 righteous people in there. He says, God, if there was 40, would you save it? Yes. But God knew there wasn't 40. Would you do it for 30? Would you do it for 20? And God says, yes. But God knew there wasn't even 10 righteous people in the city. But nevertheless, Abraham, his heart was in that city because he had family in that city. His nephew was in that city. And he had to do all he could to get his loved ones out of that city before it went down. That's how merciful God is. And God says, I'll save it for 10. I'll save it for 10. So here's what we see as a result of Lot's uh, Poor choices. 
four things we can learn real quick. Number one, Lot's number one through his poor choices. Number one, he lost his spiritual authority as a father. God made him into a spiritual father. And then he lost his authority because in verse 14, we read the scripture. He went to his son-in-laws and he said, get out of here. It's going down. Something's going to happen. Get out of the city. And then you know what the Bible says? They didn't take him serious. Imagine having an urgent message for your family, having an urgent message for your loved one and trying to tell them, listen, we, we, you got to make a change. And, and they look at you and they say, ah, the Bible says that the southern laws thought he was joking. They said, man, get out of here. You're, you're over here telling us to live like that. You're the one that taught us to live like this. You're the one that taught us to do these things. You're the ones that taught us to compromise. You're the one that taught us to sin. Now you expect us to listen to you? Is that too strong? Because that's what happened. He lost his spiritual authority. He was unable to mobilize his son, secondly, and mobilize his family in a time of crisis. And I, and I want to say something to you fathers this morning. You need your spiritual authority. You need to protect and guard your authority. And I'm going to tell you why. Because sooner or later, crisis will hit your home. Sooner or later, the devil will bring your life and your family under attack. Nobody's exempt from problems. Preachers aren't exempt from problems. Leaders are not exempt from problems. It's called life. And when that crisis comes to your house, you're going to need your spiritual authority to get your family and get your loved ones out of that crisis. Stop playing games with your testimony. Come on, somebody. He lost his ability to move his family. Third thing, he lost all of his possessions and belongings. Think about this. He had everything. He had cattle, sheep, land, uh, water, wine, oil. He had, all, he had everything he needed, grain. But when he went into the city, and when the city went down, he actually lost all of his possessions. When he escaped from there, he, he got out by the skin of his teeth. By the skin of his teeth. He went from being the most blessed man in the land. His blessing was in comparison to Father Abraham. Imagine that. His blessing was competing with Father Abraham, and now he's running out of the city with only the shirt on his back. When Sodom fell, his life savings went with it. And what's the fourth thing, and I think probably the most tragic thing, is that he lost his loved ones. Now, I know it's Father's Day, and you came to Father's Day and said, man, I thought I was going to get encouraged. <laughs> and I'm more discouraged now than when I came in. <laughs> man, Pastor, you put me on a bummer. Well, let me, let me share the encouraging part. One thing I've discovered in my life, that there's nothing more challenging than being a parent. There's nothing in this world more challenging than being a father. I have many titles, a, a pastor and spiritual leader and all these different titles that they bestow on me after serving the Lord all these years. But let me tell you the greatest title I have, that is the title and the responsibility of being a father to my children and a father in my family. And I want to tell you, Dad, being a dad is not easy. Every decision we make has consequences. Every decision and choice we make could stay with us for the rest of our life. But let me tell you, if you have made mistakes and you have messed up, and maybe you're here this morning and say, Pastor Al, I haven't always done it right. I want to tell you something. None of us have. 
None of us have always made the right decision. Not every one of us has always kept our temper under control. Not every one of us has always said the right thing in the, in the right moment. Not every one of us has been the best stewards with the finances and done all these different types of things. Let me tell you something. Every single one of us has made mistakes, but I've got some good news for you. We serve a God of second chances. We serve a God of third chances. We serve a God of four chances. Come on, somebody. And if you're discouraged this morning and you've made mistakes in your parenthood, You've made mistakes in your leadership. I came to tell you, it's not too late for you. God could still bless your life. God could still bless your family. But you got to make a choice this morning. You got to make a choice. Because we make our choices. And then our choices make us. Can I hear an amen? I don't want you to be discouraged. I want you to be encouraged. Because we serve a God that could give you a fresh start this morning. You know, in this message, I couldn't help but to think of myself. And I'm going to bring it home now. And being a father now to four daughters and uh, no grandchildren yet. Thank you, Jesus. <laughs> I'm happy to wait on that. But even as a spiritual father, a spiritual parent, helping to lead men and women, I begin to think about, Lord, what is it that, that, that I need? See, because I think this, if you want to be successful as a father, you need a vision. You need a vision. I think that was the problem with Lot, is Lot had a vision, and then he lost the vision. Or he had a vision, and then the vision changed. But with Abraham... God gave him a vision, and he stood faithful to that vision. How many can say amen? And what I, what I say is, God, give me a vision for my family. Give me a vision for my home. Give me a vision for the people that you've called me to lead. And I, and I pray four things in this vision, and I want to share these things with you. These are personal things to me. Are you ready to receive this? Is this helping you today? Let me share with you four prayers that I have. In, in leading my family. Number one, I pray, Father, establish yourself as the king of our home. Establish yourself as the king of our home. Now, I know some guys, you, you're so macho, aren't you? Machismo, and Latin, especially Latin men, you know, you think you're all that, and, you know, I'm the man, this is my house. And, uh, uh. How are you doing with that? <laughs> what I say is yes I'm the man but this is not my house this is God's house come on help me preach this is God's house and I say Lord you be the father of this home see we need to let the Lord be the king of our household and I know many of us fathers we run in different circles don't we we run in all kinds of different circles. You have different circles. You have your church circle. You come to church. You have your church people. Then you go to work. You got your work people. And then you got your friends and, and your buddies that you hang out, you dirt bike ride, whatever you do with them. And you have your low rider buddies. And you got these buddies. And you got your buddy. And then you, got, you run in all kinds of different circles. You got your family people. But let me tell you something. The people you make the most impact in are not the people in those circles. It's the people in your home. It's those people that see you get up in the morning and go to bed at night. They're the ones that are watching us. They're the ones that are taking it in. They may not, may not say nothing, but they could see it with their eyes, the type of life that we are living. And I think each and every one of us must remember it's not the impact you make in the church. It's the impact you make in your home. It's the impact you make in your home. I believe that every single one of us conduct ourselves a certain way in the church, don't we? But how many know the most important place we conduct ourselves should be in our home? You know, here's something I've learned uh, as my children have gotten older. One thing I've noticed about my kids, they're getting older now, is that, that, that their challenges have changed. Okay? Their challenges have changed. You know, 
Um, I used to think that when my kids got older, it would get easier. <laughs> you know, and, and I'm starting to realize that, in fact, the older they get, it actually gets harder. And it also actually also gets more expensive. <laughs> Come on, somebody. And the older they get, actually the dumber I get. Because when they were small, whoo, I was smart. Man, when they were small, I was like a genius. But now I don't know nothing. Dad, you don't know. You don't know. Come on, somebody. And as my children have got older, I've realized that I can't even lead my own family. That it has to be God that's going to lead my family. Come on, somebody, help me out. You know, now I look at my children and they, you know, they, they think I'm dumb. I go with it. I go with it. I like, I'm going to roll with this one. And you know what's funny is I, I I can look at them and I can say you know you know guys I don't have all the answers I don't know why the world is the way it is I don't know why that's happening to you I don't know what's going on I can't figure that out myself but there is one thing I can do I may not know but we serve a God that knows all things. And I'm not the king of this house. He is the king of this house. He's in control of our lives. And I may not be able to give you the answer, but I could pray with you. I think that's what our kids need more than everything. They don't need your wisdom. They don't need you to give fine words. They need someone that's going to come along and say, listen, baby, I will pray with you. I will support you spiritually. I don't have all the answers, but he's a good, good father, and he's going to speak to our family. Come on and give God a praise if you agree with that right now. He's the king of our home. I may not know the future, but he does. What's the second thing I pray? Father, not only be the king of our home, but Father, teach us your ways. Teach us your ways. You know, I want the word of God to not only be the ruling authority, but I want the word of God to be the final authority of my home. How many of you believe the word of God to be true? And, and I want to say this to you, Dad. We need it more than ever. We need it more than ever because of the times in which we live. There are so many voices in this world that are creating confusion in our children. Some of you are children still. I know you feel like you're a man or a woman, but you're still a child. You're 20, I'm 22. You're a baby. Be quiet. <laughs> and you're confused because you're allowing social media to create the way you think. And that's always changing. And, and, and we, you know, we look at the social media platforms and Facebook and Instagram and Twitter and all these different things, and we're beginning to create our opinion. You know, there was a day where truth was truth. My generation, the old school generation, hey, man, truth was truth. But you know what's happening with these postmoderns and these millennials? They're creating their own truth. They're creating it as it goes. They say, is that your truth? Well, that's your truth. I respect your truth. Is that your reality? I respect your reality. Then we wonder why they're so confused. They don't know if they're boys or girls. Is that too strong on a Sunday morning? They're confused. And we need to say, Lord, teach us your ways. Because the media has desensitized Christian values, not only in the world, but also in the church. Even the church has watered down marriage and watered down families. And you know what we need? We need to get our families back into the word of God as the final authority in the home. Come on, if you agree with it, you should give the Lord the biggest clap if you agree with it in this church. The word of God is the authority. You see, the word is not just good values, like they tell you. You're, you, you, you. I read the Bible. That's good. 
The Bible is the good book. You're a Christian? That's good. It's almost insulting. What do you mean it's good? What are you talking about? <laughs> it's good to you? you? You approve of me serving God? I'm here to serve you? It's good. Even the rich young ruler told Jesus, he goes, good teacher. He says, who are you calling good? There's only one that's good, and that is God. Can I hear an amen? Don't talk to me like that. And I said, look up that word good, because the word of God is not just good values. It's God's values. And I wanted you to know there's a difference. Dad, there's a difference between good and God. The word good in the dictionary means this, to be desired or approved of. You know what that could mean? That could mean anything. You know, that's good, you know, today. That's good in 2018, but that's not good in 2019. That's good here. You can preach here. We're, we're open here. I'm just talking about your reality. It's good. I approve of you. Good is to be desired or approved of. But you know what God, God, godly means? In the dictionary, godly means conforming to the laws and wishes of God. And that's what we need in our home. We don't need good children. We don't need good marriages. We need children or marriages that are conforming to the will and the wishes and are pleasing God. We don't need to please man. We see where that gets us. We need fathers. We need mothers. We need families that are going to be pleasing to the Lord. Because when you're pleasing to the Lord, that's when you get the blessing of God on your life. I'm trying to help you this morning. Do you agree with me? You know what tells me is that to be godly is to be a part of something that's unchanging in principle. God is immutable. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. His word is from everlasting to everlasting. The word is good. Don't you know that the word has outlasted your life? Don't you know that before you were born, the word was here? And after you're gone, the word will still be here? Don't you know that this word has outlasted wars? They tried to burn it. They tried to bury it in the ground, but it keeps on rising again. You ain't saying nothing to me. Hitler couldn't burn the Bible. Mao Zedong couldn't have burned the Bible. Joseph Stalin couldn't burn the Bible. It's still here today because it's the word of God, and it is God. And when you build your house on the rock, no storm, no fire, no war will take your house down. We need the word. And if you want to have a family and a marriage that's lasting, build it on the word. I'm going to be done right now. Third thing. You get something today? Third thing is that my prayer is this. Father, give us strength to carry out your plan. We know the plan. But you know what we really need, God? Is in carrying it out. It's in doing the plan. And you know when we need that strength? Not when times are good. It's easy to serve God when times are good. We need the strength to carry out the plan when times are tough. Come on, say amen. amen. When times are tough. That even when we as parents, as fathers, mothers, have to make difficult decisions. And how many know you will? To make difficult decisions that must be made that will be able to stand upon the word of God that supports that difficult decision. I, I want to share this with you, dads. It's easy to talk the talk. But eventually, you'll have to walk the walk. Maybe not now. But eventually, you'll have to live out what you've been preaching about. Eventually, You'll have to act on what's been coming out of your mouth. 
eventually you're going to have to stand on what you believe. This requires strength. This requires strength. How many know we can't do that in our own strength? This sometimes requires tough love. Have you ever had to put down that tough love? Oh, that hurts, doesn't it? Sometimes you'll have to say no. And let me tell you, when you say no and when you put down that tough love, guess what there's going to be? There's going to be tears. There's going to be yelling. There's going to be tantrums. There's going to be doors slamming. There's going to be people jumping in the cars and driving off. And, ah! But I'm not giving you my word. I'm giving you God's word. And if, God, if it's God's word and you do God's word, the godly blessing will follow when you're obedient to his word. That's when we need the strength. That's when we'll get the godly outcome. And as Matthew comes to the keyboard, I want to encourage all the dads. I know there's some single moms here too. Did you get something out of this too? Did you get something out of this too? I respect single moms. I really do. I, w I was, you know, my mom was a single mom. So I respect you single moms. But the fourth thing we need, and this is what I pray, is God, not only give me strength to carry out your plan, but Father, establish my house to the generations. Establish my house for the generations. See, I recognize this is that I have kids, but eventually, you know, grandkids are going to come. You know, not now. So don't get any ideas. Uh, and I think about them. I, I think about them sometimes. You know, I, I, I first think, I hope they're cute, because I don't want no ugly grandkids. No ugly grandkids. I don't want it to be like, oh, Pastor, they're so cute. And they walk away, oh, my God, it's the most ugliest kid I ever seen. So that means they have to marry handsome husbands, not ugly ones. <laughs> Anyhow, that's another sermon. <laughs> and I fantasize, I dream about them. I, I, I pray that I have a grandson one day. Go to the games with him. Teach him to golf. Go to the Laker game. Boxing. Take him with me. Come on, we're going to go sit ringside, mijo. Let's go. He's going to be blessed. That's all I know. But I want to build a house that's a place of safety for my family. I, I want my home to be a place of refuge for my children and my grandchildren. I, I want them to be able to come around me and Mama Georgina when we get older. I could picture her with some beans right there, hooking it up. Hey, mijo, sit down. You want some beans? You want a burrito, bean and cheese? You want some fideo? <laughs> she makes the bomb fideo, dude. My wife can cook. I don't know if you know that, but Georgina could get down in the kitchen. She's up there with some of the women. She gets down. She's a real deal. And um, sit down, mijo. I want them to come and feel like it's a place where they could take off their armor. We all know what it is to go to someone's house and we put on double armor. <laughs> We're going over to the in-law's house, put on the armor. Put on your helmet, chin strap, mouth guard. Here we go. That's real. Come on, that's real. And I want them to come to my house and the son-in-law could come too if he wants. Because I'll leave him in Sodom. I don't care. I, he acts up. Brother, you stay. Let's go, girls. You can stay over there. Okay, I'm going to get out of the flesh now. I guess. <laughs> I'm 
but I want them to look at my home as a place of grace, a place of healing, a place of rest, a, a place of restoration. I want it to be a place where my children and my grandchildren could come and feel the presence of the living God. How about you? How about you? Come on, somebody. A place of safety. And I'll tell you, man, I, I can't help but to think about the prodigal son fa son's father. You know the story. The boy, he, he was bad. He took his inheritance and he ran from home. He ran from home. And you know the story. He ended up with the pigs. I mean, he had a lot of experience. He was wiped out of everything. And he ended up with the pigs. He says, I'm going to go back to my father. And I'm going to just say, I'll just be a slave. But because of the father's love for him, he could never make his son a slave. Just like God's love towards us. When we come back to him, he doesn't look at us as slaves. He looks at us as sons and as daughters. And you know the story that when he, the Bible says when he saw his son coming, you know the story that he ran out to him, right? And I know when we read it, we think, oh, what a loving father. He really missed him. You can visualize yourself. Oh, mijo, I missed you. You're running out there. That, that's not why he was running out there. If you really study the story, in those days, they took it very serious when a child dishonored their father. According to the law, and I try to teach my kids this all the time. They don't catch it, but watch. <laughs> According to the Jewish law, if they dishonored their parents, the whole village could stone them to death. You see, wow, that seems harsh, but that's how they dealt with it. Because they said, if this boy could dishonor his father, then it's going to make my son want to dishonor me. So they nipped it in the bud. They weren't playing no games. So I know we think, oh, he was running out there because he was so, well, he was loving, but he wasn't running out there because he missed him. He was running out there because he wanted to get a hold of him before the village did. That's why he said, quickly, bring me the rope. Quickly, give me the ring. Quickly, give me the sandals. Put it on his feet. Make it seem like he never left. Make it seem like he never backslid. Make it seem like he never fell. Make it seem like he never betrayed me. Come on, get it. Because if you don't get that coat on him, they're going to come and get him. And that's what we need. We need a place of grace. We need some fathers full of love. We need some fathers and mothers full of forgiveness. And if you've been astray, you need to come back home this morning before they get you. Because this is a place of grace this is a place of healing and this is a place of restoration God loves you and I came to tell you if you've made mistakes we've all made mistakes we've all made mistakes Say, pastor have you made mistakes oh man they give me these cards and they call me on the stage I, I, it's uncomfortable for me because I know that I don't deserve to be up here. I don't deserve to be your pastor. I don't deserve to lead you. Because I've made mistakes. I've got flaws just like everybody else. But the one thing I have chosen to do is to stay in the perfect will of God no matter what. And to make sure my family stays in the perfect will of God. No, come on, somebody. No matter what. And Joe, God's never let me down. Johnny, God's never let me down. Algy, God's never let me down. He's come through time and time and time again. I don't know where you're at this morning, but I know God is here. But he's looking for a man that says, you know what? Things can change. He's looking for a mom that says, things can change. But I've got to make those choices. And if this message ministered to you in any way, I just want you to come on up here right now and spend a few minutes with the Lord. Dad, come on up. No matter the mistakes you made, it's never too late. It's never too late. 
He's a God of second chances and third chances.